Mark a blind email. He didn't know who I was. And about an hour later, I got a response. I got a response. And um, he said, sure, I'll help if I can. Let's see if Willa, the dog, Willa is eligible. And within two weeks, the vaccine was on its way to Cincinnati to treat this dog. Willa was on her way to Cincinnati, had a leg amputated, got chemotherapy, and then got this vaccine that Mark was developing to treat dog cancers and dogs. And the last update I got about a year later was Willa was charging across this field with the three brothers. And I can guarantee she, on three legs, she could outrun anyone in this in this room. So it's really a fantastic story. And Mark, as you'll hear, is now trying to use the same approach to treat patients, human patients, uh, with these vaccines. And uh, even if it doesn't work in humans, at least he knows he's helping man's best friend. So that's something. So Mark, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's terrific to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction. We're actually not treating patients yet, but if if you want to, I'd be happy to collaborate with what you're about to hear today. Uh, we've all been to uh, dozens or more of bench to bedside uh, lectures. I got a little crazy with uh, alliteration here, obviously. Uh, are there any dog owners here? Dog owners? Okay. Uh, multiple dog owners. They have more than one. Oh, okay. You, uh, there are 90 million dogs in this country, 60 million families with a dog. I have two, for, so I'm one of those families that account for more than one. Uh, there are more dogs than kids under the age of 18 in this country. Uh, I had to give a talk at the USDA, which, <clears throat> excuse me, regulates most of the veterinary biologics in this country. I had to remind them that uh, there are also more dogs than hogs in this, uh, in this country, as well as more dogs than cows. So only to emphasize the point that there are a whole lot of potential patients with potential cancers that we'd like to develop better therapies for. About one in four dogs in their lifetime will get a cancer. Uh, if your dog is lucky enough to live to 10 years old, the chances of that dog uh, acquiring cancer are then about one in two. So today I'm gonna, of course, discuss uh, our studies in companion animals, uh, try and make an argument that uh, those models well, actually, they're not models. They're not models for human cancer at all. It's a parallel disease. And that's one point I'll try and emphasize today is that virtually all of the factors, the growth factors, mutations, uh, predilection to metastases, uh, therapies or therapeutic strategies are virtually identical. And you can, I think all of us will agree that uh, abyss between treating mouse cancers and human cancers is far wider uh, than treating uh, spontaneous dog cancers, which is what we're doing. I do have a conflict of interest, uh, co-founded a company that hopefully will manage uh, canine cancer care in the future. So this is my own pup that passed away about 14 years ago of uh, inoperable uh, cardiac hemangiosarcoma. So it's a, I've been both on the patient side, patient owner slot side, as well as now the therapeutic side. Hope you don't mind seeing a whole bunch of dog puppy pictures today. So what we're doing is an immune system based therapy. Of course, I have to make immunologists out of all of you, and this will take about 90 seconds really. So uh, this is a diagram of a typical immune response to any, anything, any foreign pathogen, uh, any self protein or antigen, uh, or even to tumors. So let's see if I can get this, this, oh, it is working. Okay. So it starts with an antigen presenting cell, uh, in this diagram, it's dendritic cell. There are all sorts of antigen presenting cells, macrophages, B lymphocytes can present antigens very effectively. And I'll, 
talk about that only briefly in the context of epitope spreading and why we think that may be important. But an antigen presenting cell does exactly that, presents small peptides on the surface of that dendritic cell or other APC in the context of major histocompatibility complex proteins. They typically first bump into T lymphocytes. Uh, that signal along with a second signal induces them or encourages them to develop into several different pathways. This is a very simplified version. You can either get CD8, of course, restricted killer T cells that can kill pathogens or kill tumors directly, of course. Helper T cells, which do that, provide help to B cells. The end product being antibodies that bind that pathogen, hopefully clear it, uh, or bind the tumor, hopefully clear it. Uh, immunology makes a lot of sense to me. I think that may be why I went into it. Uh, the immune system responds when it needs to, when it sees something foreign, and it's told to be turned off when that pathogen or whatever is triggering that immune response is cleared and gone. Okay. So uh, overall, I'm going to talk about cancer neoantigens. Neoantigen just simply means a new antigen that your immune system has not seen. Um, I neglected to mention that this process is also important in, quote, tolerance to lots of self tissue proteins. So in your central immune organs like the thymus and bone marrow, cell, cells of the immune system, T cells primarily, will run into self proteins and be told to die. And about 90 plus percent of the T cells that develop in the thymus actually are specific for self proteins. They're typically told to die. Out in the periphery, they'll also bump into these self proteins and be tolerized. Again, this is to protect you from attacking your own tissues. Of course, the system's not perfect because we do have autoimmune diseases and that's really represents uh, a flaw in this system of tolerance, uh, but there are ways that ha that happen as well. So new antigens that your immune system can see and respond to. Now, the cancer biologists typically think of neoantigens as products of mutation. You get a mutated gene creates a novel self protein, a novel tumor protein that potentially the immune system can respond to. But I'm here to tell you that that's not the only type of neoantigen. Neoantigens can be any cryptic, any peptides of a lot of self proteins that just your immune system has never seen before, can also be post-translationally modified proteins. Proteins that come out of the translation pathway and get things like uh, glycosylation or phosphorylation or other many other uh, protein modifications that change the look of self proteins to your immune system. And regarding things, uh, syndromes like autoimmune diseases and cancer, inflammation greatly amplifies the emergence uh, or the, the frequency of post-translational modifications in tissues. So this is one primary way that both tumors via the tumor microenvironment, as well as other sites of inflammation, uh, the pancreas, uh, for example, in type one diabetes, inflammation will, will cause a number of different neoantigens to arise. How do you find them? Well, various omics, proteomics, uh, of course, genomics. And what do we do with them once we find them? Well, we can think about using them as neoantigen therapies, uh, either triggering immune responses to them or tolerance mechanisms, for example, uh, allergens uh, that may be neoantigens we can try and tolerize. We can try and shut down the immune system to neoantigens like those. They can also be used in diagnostics. I'll talk about that briefly in a minute. Uh, they can monitor uh, pathology of disease, be a marker of severity of pathology. I'll give you a few examples of that. So this is work that has come out of our laboratory in the last few years, just to emphasize the fact that uh, neoantigens are important in lots of syndromes like autoimmune diseases. Notably, we found a protein modification in a pancreatic beta cell glucokinase. It's citrullinated, 
antibodies arise to that modified neoantigen in type 1 diabetes. And in fact, it's one of the earliest immunologic markers of type 1 diabetes. Uh, and we find it in human patients long before the onset of things like anti-insulin antibodies. And it's becoming a diagnostic marker for diseases like uh, uh, type 1 diabetes. Notably, rheumatoid arthritis is another disease that targets modified cell proteins, citrulline modified proteins. This is a diagnostic marker in the clinical labs upstairs. Uh, we did publish now a few papers about what I'll talk about today with some detail that uh, I won't be able to get to today, so you're welcome to look at those. Uh, and then I'll tell you some of our unpublished stories uh, today as well. So how do we find them? Again, either proteomics or genomics. This is one paper that I'll cite. There are many examples like this. Uh, you take a tumor sample from a patient. Uh, bring, uh, you cleave proteins that are off the MHC molecule on immune cells, put them through mass spectroscopy and identify whatever is sticking to those MHC proteins. Uh, genomics, of course, define mutations. Those also predict uh, certain modified uh, neoantigens as well. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, clinically, at least, neoantigen-specific T cells are linked with clinical efficacy of lots of other adjuvant therapies like checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about uh, the prominence of adoptive T cell therapies. Uh, it's not a perfect system in the laboratory, at least. There are algorithms to predict neoantigens and when they're going to bind to a particular MHC. Those are not perfect. And in fact, uh, a lot of the predicted neoantigens don't end up being a neoantigen at all. Uh, once you get them, of course, you can do a number of things. You can choose to vaccinate against them in any number of ways. You can make mRNAs of those neoantigens, uh, peptide based neoantigen therapies, which I'll talk more about today as well. This is one study out of non-small cell lung cancer patients that show T cell responses to various neoantigens of KRAS and HER2. I bring it up because for a couple of interesting points is that based on the individual HLA makeup, of individual patients, of course, they will respond to different neoantigens. That's illustrated here. There are five patients that you can see here. And all you have to realize is that different T cells respond to different neoantigens in individual patients. The also, uh, another point worth bringing up is in the boxes here, T cells are sometimes promiscuous they will bind and respond to the neoantigen as well as to the native peptide, to the native unmodified protein. That's not unusual. So you really just don't know until you uh, experimentally determine uh, these outcomes. So in part, the reason uh, this kind of study is important. It also emphasizes the importance of epitope spreading and efficacy of uh, not only clearing pathogens, but of clearing tumors. And this is one recent study uh, illustrating that neoantigen therapies lead to this epitope spreading where not only one site on the target protein, tumor protein is bound, but also other sites on the tumor protein as well. That happens by a mechanism that uh, we studied now a few decades ago. Uh, and one manner in which this happens is that a B lymphocyte can be a terrific antigen presenting cell. Uh, once that B cell is triggered by a neoantigen, uh, even a short peptide, that B cell receptor often binds the native intact protein. So for example, this could be a protein that's a tissue protein and diabetes or cancer. It takes it up into the B cell. It digests that protein and presents now a number of different peptides on the surface for priming a second tier of T lymphocytes that in turn provide help to a second or third tier of B 
lymphocytes. So what was originally a very restricted immune response to a tissue antigen can become very diverse, amplified, and uh, that's what epitope spreading is. Uh, we know that that's important in effective cancer therapies. So uh, the media has been far ahead of actually many scientists in appreciating what studying various diseases in dogs can contribute to our understanding of human uh, pathology. So as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, the canine cancers share uh, with almost complete identity a lot of the tumor markers and pathways that human cancers do. Uh, you can see that humans and dogs do get virtually all the same types of cancer, gliomas, uh, oral melanoma in dogs, actually a lot more frequent than you might uh, appreciate, liquid tumors, lymphomas and leukemias, um, breast cancers, bladder cancer, which is part of our own studies, prostate cancer, uh, osteosarcomas are typically very frequent in dogs, less so. It's a, a rare cancer in humans, about 100,000 patients a year. Uh, so while the pathways are very similar regarding the genetics, the genomics, mutations, uh, the predilection for metastases, even the sites of metastases in a particular cancer are virtually identical in, in certain cancers in dogs and humans. Uh, the frequency is very different between dogs. That's one difference uh, between dogs and humans. Uh, and that's illustrated in the lower right. Dogs have a high frequency of liquid tumors, lymphomas, leukemias, uh, soft tissue sarcomas, uh, osteosarcomas, again, as I mentioned. There are a number of therapies that uh, have been translated from dogs to humans, including early attempts at bone marrow uh, transplantation, both autologous and allogeneic, uh, various types of radiation therapy, uh, limb sparing surgery. I'll have a, a illustration of that. Uh, dogs make great models for doing drug uh, metabolism studies, pharmacokinetics. Uh, those studies are typically much more accurate in a 100-pound dog than a 20-gram mouse uh, relative to what human uh, pharmacokinetics may find. Uh, and then certain drug therapies as well, oncolytic viruses. I've listed just a few here. There have been a number of therapeutic uh, pathways for de uh, developing oncolytic viruses in canine cancers. Uh, Again, <clears throat> limb sparing surgery pioneered in dog surgery for osteosarcoma. This is from the early mid eighties on the left, uh, by comparison, a human cancer, a human osteosarcoma patient with limb sparing surgery on the right. Human to canine, of course, the veterinary Oncology communities use lots of drugs that are used off-label treating dog cancers. Uh, radiation therapy has been pioneered in humans, uh, now applied to dogs. Uh, checkpoint immunotherapies are only beginning to find their way into treating dog cancers. There is a USDA-approved anti-PD-1 uh, therapy made by Merck. We are collaborating with Merck in some of our studies. And there are anti pdl one inhibitors in process. And of course, these have, need to be canonized in order to be used in, in dog patients. The human uh, reagents just don't work because they're rejected. Lots of compounds, chemotherapies uh, that are now used again off-label in treating dog cancers. Those are listed here. Lepatinib, which many of you know about, small molecule inhibitors of both EGFR and HER2, one of the new first-line treatments for bladder cancer in dogs. There's an interesting and useful, for any of you doing genomics and wondering if your human genomics study have a parallel universe in dog cancers, there is a data bank that you can access free of charge, of course, uh, 
uh, that's controlled by the NIH and it's updated monthly, actually, uh, that has lots of genomic studies and various dog cancer models. And this provides a source for data mining, if you will. Uh, if you're wondering if a particular human cancer mutation may be modeled in canine cancers, this is the perfect site to do that. In fact, it's been very helpful in defining uh, the genetics, the genomics, and molecular profiling uh, of gliomas and comparisons between human and canine gliomas. Uh, there's a terrific investigator that runs the comparative oncology program at the NIH, Amy LeBlanc. She manages this genomics library. She's out of her own lab defined uh, mutations in a number of uh, uh, genes comparable to human gliomas, PI3 kinase, AKT, EGFR, uh, TP53, notably. Uh, there are similar methylation patterns in both canine and human gliomas. Uh, Overexpression of uh, platelet-derived uh, growth factor alpha, uh, EGFR amplification, and various other mutations. And uh, her studies indicated that at least from the canine uh, glioma side, is that those mutations more closely resemble pediatric gliomas as opposed to adult, which have uh, some very well-defined differences. Uh, there's a second uh, group of studies done in osteosarcoma comparing human and canine. They share uh, frequently somatic copy numbers and alterations in mutations in TP53, and the other genes that you can see here. They also have uh, a shared phenotype of the tumor microenvironment, meaning the cells uh, that uh, inhabit the primary sites of osteosarcoma, comparable in both humans and dogs. Again, emphasizing the fact that what we learn about these uh, Issues like tumor and microenvironment in dogs can greatly facilitate what we know and learn about the microenvironment in humans. So we picked the herb B family of proteins to target neoantigens for a couple of reasons. One uh, is that we knew there are antibody-based therapies that are effective against this family of proteins, Herceptin and Herbitux notably, of course. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a story about that. These are, as you probably well know, these are surface signaling proteins found on uh, to a various extent on different tumors and even, even uh, expressed differently in the primary site versus metastatic sites. We know from studying both human and canine cancers, for example, osteosarcoma metastases in the lung, express a very different profile of herb B family proteins than is found in the primary site. And again, that triggers thoughts about how to treat this disease, creating therapies that may be effective against the primary site versus metastases. Uh, canine studies have also been used to examine uh, why and how humans are refractory to various EGFR, HER2 drug therapies. So I'll just go over this briefly. This is, of course, the Erby family of proteins consist of EGFR, HER2, HER3, HER4. These are proteins that are found in monomers on the cell surface. They dimerize to create a signaling complex that signals within the cell, goes to the nucleus, and uh, amplifies tumor cell proliferation, tumor cell survival, uh, increases invasion and metastatic processes. Uh, there are ligands for the various ERB family members. And of course, therapeutic strategies are designed at inhibiting these proteins either at the surface or within cells, of course. And this illustrates the human uh, both extracellular, uh, extracellular uh, therapeutic strategies as well as intracellular ones, cetuximab, for example, uh, trastuzumab, Herceptin, uh, as well as small molecule inhibitors of these signaling pathways. And I already mentioned that lipidamide 
is uh, one of the new uh, drugs being treated uh, using to treat various canine cancers. So what canine cancers express this family of proteins? We have clinical trials ongoing in osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, comparable to human angiosarcoma, uh, transitional cell carcinoma, bladder cancer, if you will, in humans. And of course, a number of other dog cancers express various family members to various degrees, either EGFR HER2 or HER3. I'm not gonna talk about HER3 today too much. Notably, the liquid cancers do not express EGFR, of course. And it's not clear either in human studies or in our dog cancer studies how the level or the quantity of EGFR expression or how it may dimerize or heterodimerize on individual tumor cell affects or correlate to outcomes of various immune-based therapies or even small molecule inhibitors. Uh, we were aided by studies that defined the crystal structure of EGFR. This is the extracellular domain of EGFR. And in red, you can see where cetuximab binds. Uh, in defining a potential neoantigen, we wanted to get at an extracellular site that was in close proximity of where cetuximab binds with the theory that potentially an immune response and antibody response to that site would have the same biology of uh, cetuximab. Uh, we picked one, you can see it here in orange. I'm not showing you the failures. We picked about six or eight or 10 other sites that turned out not to be neoantigens at all, engendered or uh, amplified no immune responses. Uh, and we first studied these in mouse models of cancer. So this is a site we ended up with. Uh, it is a site of high, almost identical homology between human and mice and dogs. And that is illustrated here. So human and mouse share exact amino acid sequence homology at this site that we chose. Dog, uh, the dog site differs by one amino acid. Uh, it is also highly homologous to the site, a similar site on HER3 and HER2. That's uh, emphasized here. So that canine EGFR, HER2, and 3 all have a shared amino acid sequence on the surface of these proteins. Uh, and it was also surface accessible on these proteins as well. So the rationale here, which actually turned out to be true, is if that we can trigger an immune response, antibodies and T cells that bind one site on EGFR, that it may bind a homologous site on HER2 and HER3. Now, why is that important? Well, some forms of uh, mechanisms that control uh, inability to respond to EGFR therapies make humans refractory to various therapies are defined by those heterodimers, which ones heterodimerize with each other. So the rationale again is if EGFR chooses to heterodimerize with HER2 or HER3, that EGFR specific therapies no long, may no longer work, but if one therapy, one antibody that could bind all three ligands, uh, does that supersede that ability to, uh, for tumor cells to resist killing by EGFR-mediated immune therapies. So uh, these were and continue to be our exploratory studies. We're studying, again, three cancers, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, and bladder cancer. We typically ask that the veterinarians uh, in these clinical trials uh, this is a difficult question to, of course, answer is whether a dog or a human is going to survive three months or greater or longer. And the reason we did that is this is an immune-based therapy. It's two injections, three weeks apart. It takes about three or four weeks to generate an active antibody or T cell response to these neoantigens. So in order to define efficacy, we wanted to at least give the patients, the dogs, 
a chance to make a vigorous immune response, and then we could hopefully measure some outcomes that were meaningful. So it's this EGFR uh, peptide neoantigen. We mix a toll-like receptor agonist, can be CPG. We've used others as well. And an oil-based adjuvant called Montanide ISA51. It's made by a company in France. This is a GMP quality oil adjuvant. It's already used in a number of human-based vaccination studies. So they get two injections, three weeks apart. We take blood samples throughout. Uh, we assay them by flow cytometry and, in, and many several other laboratory um, processes. We try and get tissues, tumor tissues from dogs throughout. If we can get them, not always easy to do. For this study, radiographs uh, are required every three months so we can potentially follow metastases of these patients. And uh, everything's uploaded uh, into uh, the Yale REDCap system, much like all the other clinical trials are here. So we have very well articulated data from our patient subsets, date of birth, date of diagnosis, uh, every clinical visit, every radiograph, uh, other meds that the dogs are on, gender, breed, um, trying to think what else. What other things do we collect, Esther Rennell? Am I getting most of them? Getting most of the important ones, at least. Okay, so here's the overall strategy. Dog comes into the uh, clinic, already has pathology diagnosed tumors of those three types. Uh, they will get standard of care. And depending on the cancer type, standard of care, for example, for osteosarcoma, at least appendicular osteosarcoma is amputation. Some get um, uh, limb sparing surgery, very few anymore though. <clears throat> for amputation and carboplatin, four to six rounds with or without our neoantigen therapy. There are other standards of care for the other tumors, which I'll talk about in a second. So again, the strategy, inject the dog twice. We can measure antibodies that arise to the neoantigen. And the strategy is that we're blocking or directly killing EGFR bearing tumor targets. So these are the serologies of several cohorts of our dog patients, just like how humans respond to a particular vaccination, such as the same with dogs. Humans respond differently because we all have different HLA uh, composition. So we all don't um, respond the same to things like flu or COVID vaccination. We will have different titers, different levels of immune responses, such as the case for dogs to this neoantigen. We get anywhere from four to 30 fold increases in um, antibody responses to this protein. Importantly, the immune responses, the antibody responses do bind uh, cell-based EGFR when it's presented on living cells. These are A431 human tumor cell lines that express EGFR. Uh, they also, the immune responses also bind a HER2 bearing human tumor cell, MDA MB453. These do not express EGFR. Again, supporting the outcome that this cross-reactive peptide, the sequence that is shared between EGFR, HER2, and HER3, does in fact bind the native protein on cells in which it resides. Okay, so then we went to really the strategies that were used to screen Perceptin and Herbitux when they were being developed. How do they kill tumors? Do they block signaling through the cell surface proteins? Uh, do they kill tumors directly? This is one example of how immune responses in our dog patients block signaling through the EGFR and HER2 pathways. So for example, in the top panel, this is a canine osteosarcoma cell line. You can measure phospho-EGFR. No antibody gives this signal. Uh, Anti-EGFR control antibody blocks that signaling. Pre-immune, again, not blocked. Immune serum from one of our dogs blocks very nicely. nicely. 
graphical representation of that is here. Also inhibits uh, signaling through a human uh, EGFR bearing cell line A431 that's illustrated here. So again, has the biology that you want in an EGFR therapy, block signaling, one of the things you want. So do the immune responses actually bind tumor tissue? And this is a number of uh, stainings for how that happens. There are a number of dogs listed uh, on this slide. <clears throat> Controls on the right, normal dog serum, and EGFR antibody control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Various dog sera from our cohort, either pre-immune or immune sera. Uh, these are osteosarcoma cells lighting up with post-immune serum. Again, indicating that those osteosarcoma cells are expressing the targets that are uh, uh, induced by our neoantigen immunization. So getting to some of the other nuances, osteosarcoma is a disease both in humans and in dogs in which metastases to the lung is the most important factor of morbidity and mortality. This is one patient that uh, in fact had that. This is Cody. Dog HIPAA uh, rules are very different than human. Cody didn't mind. I got his consent actually. So Cody had amputation of a primary tumor, osteosarcoma, of course, left front leg, as you can see, uh, started to fail conventional therapy, carboplatin. Had a metastasis to the lung. We enrolled this dog. I wasn't actually expecting much to happen. Within about six or eight months, that uh, lung metastasis resolved. Cody lived uh, another three and a half years ended up actually getting a second unrelated tumor, hemangiosarcoma, from which uh, the dog did not survive. So overall, among a cohort of osteosarcoma patients, specifically, standard of care, 12-month survival with standard of care, amputation, carboplatin, about 30 to 35 or 40% of dogs will survive one year, 12 months. Uh, adding this neoantigen therapy to standard of care uh, increases survival to about 60, 65%. So quite a dramatic difference. And that's taking all, uh, all comers, all dogs within this group with or without metastases. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And the panel's on the right again, just to show that antibodies from Cody bind both dog and human cell lines that uh, express these proteins, the ERB family of proteins. Cody was not a one-off for clearing a lung metastases. We have at least four other examples. Uh, three are on the top panels here. Uh, we see resolution or at least stasis of many uh, lung mets, meaning they don't change in size over time. These are three that happen to resolve happens anywhere between three and 11 months after <clears throat> initiation of therapy. The bottom panel is a primary site in the hip that couldn't be removed surgically, but over now close to two years, uh, which the, uh, is still gone, still resolved in this particular patient. So again, in humans and in dogs, this is the biggest problem in survival uh, in this patient subset in this type of cancer. There, we have an ongoing study at Washington State University Vet School. Rance Sellen is running that. Rance has a program for treating canine osteosarcoma without amputation, without chemotherapy. It's irradiation therapy, eight gray over given over two days uh, with or without our neoantigen EGFR therapy. And this is very recent data from Rance at Washington State. So in his cohort, the number is not great, 11 patients. Uh, survival, again, this is just radiation and EGFR neoantigen therapy, <clears throat> uh, a median survival of almost a year. Without neoantigen therapy from his cohort of, of patients, again, done right in his clinics, uh, excluding our EGFR therapy patients only survive 136 plus or minus days. So... Again, survival 
benefit with this neoantigen therapy. Uh, overall, this is from different clinics, not Washington State University. This is again, amputation, chemotherapy, carboplatin plus or minus EGFR therapy. All of these dogs did not have lung mets on original diagnosis. Their median survival is about uh, 388 days, two years survival is 31%. Again, significantly better than standard of care. We subsetted these patients. Now in canine osteosarcoma, virtually all patients will get a lung met within about one year. Uh, in our study, these were all dogs that did not have lung mets at the origin of the study, got our therapy with standard of care. Only about half of them ended up getting lung mets. And this is the survival curve for those that either did get lung mets or remained metastasis free. As you'd predict, the ones that didn't get mets lived significantly longer. Median survival now is well over a year versus survival uh, in dogs that did get lung mets of less than a year, 229 days. So we're just now beginning or trying to understand how things like the tumor microenvironment, expression of various levels of EGFR on individual osteosarcoma patients may reflect uh, clinical efficacy, or perhaps the magnitude of the immune response to this EGFR neoantigen therapy. Again, comparing human studies, localized disease survive, five-year survival is pretty good, 76%. If there's regional spread in oste human osteosarcoma, less, as I mentioned earlier, METs to the lung, not good in humans either. Going to move to hemangiosarcoma. <clears throat> this is arises in the spleen of dogs. Uh, standard of care is splenectomy and doxorubicin with or without our EGFR therapy. So without are the yellow lines in the top panel. Stage one is localized disease in the spleen. Stage two has some infiltration of subcutaneous tissues in the spleen. And stage three has distant METs, liver or elsewhere. So significant improvement of uh, survival in dogs getting splenectomy, doxorubicin and EGFR therapy, uh, 200 and let's see, 236 days. Hemangiosarcoma is a very aggressive dog cancer. Most dogs do not survive more than 60 days, 90 days at best. Uh, and that's even with surgery. Uh, dog, untreated dogs will rarely live longer than 30 days. Again, a st statistically very significant improval of survival in stage two disease. Again, more infiltrative disease uh, compared to uh, dogs that do not get EGFR therapy. Stage three with METs couldn't do any good, just extensive disease. We don't, uh, we don't change the curve compared to standard of care. We were lucky enough to get a dog's spleen uh, that had already had our therapy. We simply used the tissue and asked, are there antibodies that are infiltrating that tumor tissue? The answer was yes. That's illustrated here on the right. CD8 T cells infiltrate those tissues as well. This is... Uh, a hemangiosarcoma tissue stained for CD8 T cells, again, after EGFR therapy. This is a normal hemangiosarcoma tissue stained with pre-immune and immune dog serum. Uh, again, illustrating the brightness on the right of EGFR HER2 uh, staining patterns. And then finally, bladder cancer. Again, very similar to human disease. Uh, dogs don't do quite as well with it. Uh, we get a mixed uh, outcome of survival. Bladder cancer really does not, at least in dogs, does not have a perfect standard of care. Sometimes it can be surgically treated if it's appropriate, if it's not uh, infiltrated into tissue. Uh, different types of bladder cancer, urethral bladder, or dogs that have both have different survival. 
But we do get better survival, again, treating dogs with uh, standard of care, either chemo uh, or surgery and chemo along with EGFR neoantigen therapy. Bladder cancer that glows with uh, antibodies that arise from EGFR neoantigen therapy. Those on the top versus uh, non-cancer tissue on the bottom, control bladder. Actually, it's, yeah, uh, non-tumor tissue. So how do you begin to think about this in terms of translating this into human neoantigen therapies? First, you want to know if it potentially, this neoantigen that we have been studying in dogs will potentially bind human HLA proteins. That's what you need to get an immune response. This is an algorithm that we put our neoantigen sequence, amino acid sequence through, and about 95% of humans will bind theoretically now, and the algorithms are not perfect, but uh, it's predicted that most humans, uh, HLA that express these HLA alleles will bind this neoantigen, <clears throat> uh, as well as class two HLA DQ uh, to a lesser extent, more than half though. So that's really as far as we've gotten in trying to translate this into human disease. Uh, We'll see what happens in the future. I don't have to explain to this audience what uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapies look like, and I won't have time today to go over this data yet. Uh, Merck has developed the first checkpoint inhibitor for use in canine cancers. It's an anti-PD-1. We have an ongoing clinical trial in hemangiosarcoma combining anti-PD-1 with our EGFR neoantigen therapy to see if the combination therapy works better than either therapy alone. Uh, we just started this several months ago and we really don't have enough patients yet for statistical significance. So we're not the first to think of this and you've probably seen lots of other strategies that utilize um, neoantigen therapies in humans. And if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there are about 190 or so different trials either using personalized neoantigens or DNA or potentially dendritic cell vaccines. Why would one want to use this? Well, at least in our case, cost of production is significantly less than things like monoclonal antibody therapies. It's more easily administered, injected, uh, not requiring long-term IV therapy. Uh, the side effects are minimal, a little swelling at the site, at least in our dog patients. Bunch of happy patients, which I sleep well at night for. Um, so, and this is uh, this is probably the most fun I've had in a long career here at Yale, is getting to see patients doing very well, dog patients. Uh, we have a very unique one in the lower right-hand side, uh, which I'll show you in just a minute here. This was a dog that had osteosarcoma, uh, front limb amputation, uh, had metastases to another rear limb, uh, was given our therapy about the same time as the second amputation. This is what the owner chose to do. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Behold, the single most perfect thing I have ever seen. This is a dog in my that's entire life. still surviving about three and a half years later. So. Uh, Ranger is right next to that dog. Ranger was another three and a half year survival, had a lung met, front leg amputation, and did very well for a long period of time. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, and we didn't know what Ranger pa ultimately passed away from, may have been a, uh, a rogue metastasis to the spine. Uh, it's difficult to tell, again, in a lot of these dogs, we unfortunately are not able to get certain tissues. So why are some of these things important? Well, our neoantigen EGFR therapy may, just like using monoclonal antibodies, uh, increase the efficacy of other adjuvant therapies like checkpoint inhibitors or radiation. That's illustrated in another, uh, another group of studies, not only here, but elsewhere. Um, and our future studies are really to again, define how this therapy 
we're not claiming it's going to be a standalone therapy, perhaps how it works better with standard of care with radiation or other checkpoint inhibitor therapies. We'd like to know how the tumor microenvironment, just like those of you that study human tumor microenvironments, how that uh, affects efficacy uh, of these therapies, and ultimately understanding individual cell populations in these tumors. A lot of people to thank, uh, a few of them in the audience here, Hester and Rennell. Uh, we have 12 different sites. We can't do anything without them. They're scattered around the United States. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. First, what is the issue with inbred growth streams? Imagine they are quite divergent. Does that affect response rates? Uh, <clears throat> questions uh, are, I, I assume you're asking whether tumors are potentially inbred. Um, and the answer is yes, or the immune system, yes. Yes to both. Uh, we have the data to dive into. So for example, all of our red cap data will illustrate which ones are potentially purebred versus mixed breed. And we can start to follow lineages. There is a golden retriever lifetime study that an organization does that measures frequency of different tumors just in golden retrievers uh, because it's a popular dog. There's another biobank for Labrador retrievers. Um, so the literally, we're not yet quite sure, but that data is being collected along with the genomics data that the NCI is collecting. <laughs> that is a great question. How much does PD-1 antibody for dogs cost? Um, which brings up another topic that differs, of course, between human and canine cancer care, which is economics, right? Uh, a lot of people, one flaw in the data, which you've forced me to admit to, is that, uh, again, because treating your dog is driven by economics, they get our therapy for free. We ask them to participate, get surgery, get chemotherapy, and that's an out-of-pocket expense to them unless they have pet cancer uh, insurance which very few people, only about 5% of dog owners in this country have pet insurance. So to your question, uh, it's a lot cheaper than human uh, checkpoint inhibitors, as you can imagine, but it's not cheap. It is based on the size of the dog because it's a MIG per kig uh, therapy, but anti-PD-1 from Merck will cost anywhere from, and there are six or so, six or eight, six to 10, monthly administrations uh, of anti-PD-1. And a total expense, if you have a small dog, six or 8,000, you've got big dogs, 15 to 20,000 for all of the therapy. I don't know if pet insurance even covers that yet, even though it's an approved therapy. I know this is a, a dog. This one, yeah, this is different. I understand, but I'm just curious about the economics of developing these drugs. I know people are spending a lot more money on their animals too. Yeah. So. Well, I I didn't mention this. There are two companies out there that do T cell directed, basically CAR T T cells. They expand. They get tumors. I won't mention the competitor companies. They get tumors from the dogs. They extract T cells, they grow them up, uh, send them back to the clinic uh, and infuse CD8s or C and or CD4s. Uh, that costs about uh, 20,000. But there are a couple of companies that are trying to make a, a go of that. Uh, there is another company that will take a tumor tissue basically make a gross cell lysate, construct a vaccine and give that back to the, the canine patient as well. So, but unfortunately the, it, do any, uh, anybody here with a dog with cancer, if there are, you know how antiquated 
therapies are for dogs. They just have lagged far, far behind treatments in humans. Even though a lot of these human drugs are now being used off-label in dogs, still don't know how they work. Pharmacokinetics are probably very different, dosing and et cetera. So uh, it's, they just are not yet good therapies for treating dog cancers. You have a question? Yes. Yep. So, and you may have said this and I and missed it, but the selection of your particular EGFR neoantigen, I assume that was from some, one of those genomic or proteomic screens, but have you looked at a, looking at actual neo mutations as opposed to just a particular peptide? Um, obviously you have to then screen to make sure that the cancer that that that's the animal had that mutation. Yeah. Um, but looking at that and versus combinations of neoantigen peptides as opposed to just doing one. Yeah, that's a terrific question. Either combination of peptides or looking at high frequency mutations that lead to neoantigens. <clears throat> that can be done. And in fact, I've been using that genomics website to try and define high frequency, for example, osteosarcoma, EGFR-based mutations. I think the data bank's not yet large enough to narrow it down to defining specific neoantigens. I don't think canine therapy will ever get to the point of personalized neoantigen, mutational neoantigen care. However, I could be very wrong because there are three companies that do canine genomics. So you can ask your vet to send tumor to three different companies. They'll send the owner um, mutation analysis and potentially drugs that may best be effective in that particular dog. Now the drugs may not be available, right? To the vet or to the dog. Um, they're all based on human algorithms for treating a particular mutation, but the companies exist. They're out there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.